great to be here in Chicago, the city where my, my brother went to school, uh, the Windy City. I'm here to talk about the Internet of Things today. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what it is, how did we get here, and uh, where are we going with this thing. I think the future is all open. Before I start, I wanted to tell you a little story. Uh, the picture you're looking here, you're seeing on the left side, you see the uh, primary mirror of the CAC Observatory in, in uh, Hawaii. And uh, this is probably the ultimate selfie that I ever took. Uh, they moved the entire mirror horizontally, we pointed to it, and we took this wonderful picture. I think this is one of the most amazing devices in the world. Definitely at the outer edge of things. Uh, I think in many ways, the environments and the people that actually deal with these devices probably tell a story. On the right side, there's a native Hawaiian. His name is Sniffy. I don't know if you see it there, but in his nose, there's two tubes for oxygen. There's not a lot of it at 14,000 feet over there, and this is the only man that uh, stays 24 hours. He lives there. And uh, he's actually showing us a fascinating actuator, one of the many, that operates this device. For those of you that don't know, um, this device here on the left, it's the laser, shoots about 600 kilometers in the sky. The mirror points towards the star and measures the wavefront uh, interference. It eliminates the twinkle in the star to take these amazing, beautiful pictures. The best optical device in the world, better than the Hubble telescope. So this is sort of the upper end of the kinds of devices that are connected to the internet. What is IoT? There's many definitions. You see several on the slide. McKenzie's view, Accenture, SAP, uh, Verizon, AT&T, ITU. Um, they all talk about things, connectivity to the internet, uh, a variety of ways to access it. The one definition that seems to be getting a lot of traction today is Gartner's. I don't necessarily agree with all of it. I think it's a popular definition. It's, it's the network of physical objects access to the internet that contain embedded technology to sense or interact internal states. The interesting thing is that everybody seems to agree that it is about connectivity. It is about new things. It is about machine-to-machine -machine interaction. And most importantly, it's about new experience this is operating efficiencies and new business models. At the end of the day, IoT is sort of the big frontier, not just for the internet, but for technology, particularly for Linux and open source. Uh, it brings about multiple hubs of innovation. So one way to look at this is that, you know, we see IoT as uh, connected manufacturing, robotics and in industries, connected energy, uh, we see it as smart cities, connected home, a lot of uh, things happening, including the projects here at the Linux Foundation. And, uh, of course, safety and security. The Internet of Things already arrived about seven years ago. That's the inflection point we've already been through. There was a moment in history when the number of devices, shall we say, connected devices that can access the Internet, exceeded the population in the world. It's about, about six and a half billion of them. Uh, today, the ratio of these devices to humans is about a little more than two. In the next five years, we're going to reach about 50 billion on a conservative estimate. Other companies, other corporations, and analysts estimate the number to be more like 250 billion. The uh, growth is phenomenal. Five times faster than electricity or telephony. It's uh, a few of the pictures here on the board. Everything from home sensors, entertainment, consumer devices, energy plant, factories, surveillance, uh, instrumentation for manufacturing and robotics. A very exciting future. What this brings about is what we call new pins or places in the network. 
On the left side uh, of the slide, you see the already known presence in data centers, in the enterprise or campus, in the branch office. Sometimes you hear this referred to as the carpeted space. Now we're going into the non-carpeted space. And in the case of the Hawaiian native, somewhere where very, very few people can actually uh, live. This is an interesting picture. Uh, this is actually a, a ruggedized network device we tested at Cisco. We want to make sure that it works in adverse environments, flood, rain, et cetera, uh, fire. When I saw this picture, it was a little late. I told everyone that, uh, you know, this is going to be shown at, uh, at LinuxCon. So these rubber duckies for a device that runs on Linux should have really been penguins. Uh, I'll promise to make the adjustments next time uh, when we publish these slides. But seriously, what, what you see on the left is a router in the middle is a switch over there. The, uh, they are ruggedized. We test them. These are edge devices. I'll talk a little bit about the architecture and how they fit into the Internet of Things. Uh, the, the fascinating thing, and I, I always make a point of this, the most dominant project thing in all of these by far most promising as well is Linux. <clears throat> These are all Linux devices. So what's driving this? What's causing all of this uh, tremendous growth in these devices is the declining cost of compute. If you ask Gordon Moore, Gordon, you know, how did you come up to this very interesting phenomenal law called uh, Moore's Law? He'll tell you it's not his, it's Carver Mead. Um, but anyway, according to Moore and Carver Mead, right, we all know what happens, the size of the transistors, uh, uh, consequently, uh, the cost of these devices. In the case of storage, it's a very, very fast exponential curve, faster than compute. Compute is about, it doubles every 18 months. Uh, so storage and compute accelerate at a much, much faster rate than bandwidth. Bandwidth, uh, according to uh, Nielsen, Jacob Nielsen, grows 50% every two years. So you can see here the exponential curves. What this really means is that the network scales very, very different than storage and compute. The sensors are going to grow in their abilities far beyond what we experience today. In the next five years, it's going to be just unbelievable. It's going to be daunting. It's very hard in today's terms to talk about we're going to squeeze Linux and, and you know, all of the computation and the data in this edge device, uh, it's a radically different world waiting for us out there to grab. Uh, along with this, I'll talk about you know, the concept many now know as data gravity. So I think we all understand this slide. There's three big waves. In the 70s and 80s, you went from centralized to decentralized, right? Mainframe to client server in the sort of the mid-90s to the uh, early 2000s, the model moved from decentralized to centralized, the rise of the cloud, uh, outstanding on-demand optimization uh, for operating these networks. We're right in the middle of this age. What we see with the Internet of Things is really the non-trivial extension of the cloud, where things are no longer centralized. There's massive decentralization going on because of the rising computation power at the edges and the lack of or the impedance mismatch between the data produced at the edges and then the one that can come to the core. So just a quick snapshot, how bad is this tsunami wave? Uh, every day, we generate about 2 billion billion bytes. That's about 2 to the power of 18. That's more than the network can schlep or marshal or push from the edges to the core. And that number is rising. And if you believe that Moore's law is even more accelerated in storage, things are not going to get better. They're going to get worse. Well, that's a pessimist way of saying 90% of the world uh, data uh, was created in the last two years. That number is old. It should be more like uh, 95. My favorite statistic on this is the one at the bottom. When you fly in a jet plane, each engine produces about 20 terabytes of data. You can't put that into a cloud for, for analysis. You have to do that on the engine. Not all of the data can come 
and be utilized or used during the flight. They use it for maintenance purposes later, so they save some of it, not all of it. And with 25,000, 28,000 flights per day, that number is just daunting. Um, so I mentioned that I do like the Gartner definition of IoT. This is my personal view on this, and perhaps some of my uh, colleagues at Cisco would share this as well. Um, IoT equals small sensors plus big data plus action on that data, meaning analytics. So what we're seeing with IoT is two worlds colliding to create one. Networking is changing radically. The analytics are changing. Things, the computation model is going to change dramatically. This is sort of the, the core slide, the money slide, as I call it. You see here on the left the typical architecture that we have at the top, the servers and the storage, um, the core network, then there's the edge or access network, and all of these devices at the edge. Today, what's going on is we take this data, we rise it into the cloud, sort of like the way the fog would, would act. Um, the trend, the dominating trend that we see is that this filtering analysis has to happen here. It cannot happen in the cloud. It's just impossible. It's too much data. So as a consequence, the compute model has changed. Why distributed analytics processing? You see several reasons in here. So now there's a change in where the computation happens. Very shortly, we're going to have a change in how that computation happens. The paradigm shifted. The essential difference between cloud compute and fog compute is this. What we do today is we store, we capture the data, we store it, we put it in the cloud, we analyze it, we have massive data warehouses, uh, analytics going on there, and then we make decisions to act on it. Eventually, we push notifications and actions to the devices. That was the past. That's the future. So data gravity means that the applications come to the data, not the data to the applications. Data is an interesting thing. It's very difficult, very expensive to move around. The applications will come to it and will come at the edges. So fog architecture. Fog is a non-trivial, so I, I need to underscore that it's not just a trivial extension of the cloud. It's a non-trivial extension of the cloud uh, in the distributed, organized platform where the internet meets the physical world at machine-to-machine -machine scale. Um, I think I'm going to skip this slide. What this talks about is the importance of leveraging information, so business, uh, big data analytics. Information about data, things, smart things you can say about it at the edges so that you don't deal with all of the problem of schlepping that two exabytes of data uh, uh, every, every 24 hours. So as we move through time, here's a different way to say that. As you move through time, what you, what, you have a very good knowledge of the achieved data, data that in the past you've analyzed, you've stored. It can make you or enable you to make smart decisions about data in the presence. The devices collect information in real time. We don't have enough time to move that data into the cloud. We're going to filter it. So the present has a very, very limited computational power or network access ability. We're going to have to make smart decisions about it, filter a lot of the data, jettison the rest. The stuff that we deemed essential or important for historical reasons or for justifying our actions at the edge will be moved up in the cloud and uh, will coexist there. Uh, by the way, this, for those of you that you recognize, this is a, this is a sort of the machine learning uh, 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 diagram. The, the fancy word for that is neuromorphic. So, we have the input coming in, and in parallel with you optimizing on how you're going to model. Is your model good enough to predict the right action? In real time, you actually have to take an action on that on the device. But in addition to that, you constantly look to improve your model. 
This is why, this is why we take advantage of the computational opportunity on these devices at the edge. Very, very exciting world we're going in. So, Internet of Things. This is a what-if slide. Uh, General Electric, I think, published this uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, sort of a, you know, what if we deliver a 1% improvement, for instance, in aviation, commercial aviation, 1% of fuel savings? They spread this out over 15 years, $30 billion, and then they get into power, healthcare, retail, oil and gas, which, by the way, seem to be the interesting, what I call the hubs of innovation or verticals or business opportunities in the market. It's a, it's a tremendous world the scale of which we think the cloud folks uh, have experienced, uh, you know, the kind of scale that they do at Amazon, at Google, at, you know, the big private public clouds, that pales in comparison to this. That's going to be IoT and M2M is going to be orders of magnitude bigger than that. Um, here's the, uh, the story, the narrative on sort of a summary slide on the Internet of Things, the world of machines. Uh, like its cloud predecessor, it will be mostly open source. If you look at what's in the cloud today, in fact, many would say that open source uh, sort of, you know, and cloud go hand in hand. It, one created the other. Um, the devices, the core, if you remember the four-tier architecture slide that I showed with core at the top, access, then gateway, the core access and gateway devices already are open source. In my company, I believe 80% of our revenue is based on products and services shipped with Linux. And I believe that number is not going down. That, that number is going to go up. Uh, the edge devices vary. They're all vectoring uh, very, very fast in open source. The network, the core, the access, the gateway, it's all the internet, of course, based on open source and open standards. The edge, we're going to work our way through a consolidation of protocols, renewed emphasis on robustness. And the new applications and services, this is the big thing. This is where data gravity comes into play. The model tips on its head. And there will be a rise in the way we produce applications, where they execute, how they run, what do we do, and how do we make money with them. These are amazing devices indeed. I said at the beginning that that beautiful mirror, the 36 hexagons with six actuators each that move 2,000 times per second with a precision of one one thousandth of an inch to remove that twinkle in the star. As we speak, it's pointed to the, uh, to the supermassive black hole in the center of galaxy, the best hope for us to understand what's around us outside of Earth are those kinds of devices. Remember I mentioned that is arguably perhaps not the most advanced device in the world. I'm not advocating that that be one of the T in IoT. I just wanted to give you an example of where we're going with things. This is a Large Hadron Collider. What you see on the left is essentially the channel through which the 27 kilometer uh, thing through which the protons get accelerated. What you see on the right is where that thing goes in with a very, very large coil. In a couple of places, the sensors where the collision happens and you extract the data. I don't have a picture with that. It looks like the one on the left. That thing is running on Linux. I think all the people that ever contributed to the Linux kernel should be very proud of that. The advanced network uh, operated, designed and operated by Caltech at CERN, which actually it's a beautiful place, right? I mean, this is where the World Wide Web was designed and created. It's running on Linux. The network is based on OpenFlow. They set every world record in uh, data speeds, currently running at about one terabit per second. My prediction for Internet of Things, new IoT-specific service providers will emerge. That is, in my opinion, the biggest thing that we're experiencing, and it's just coming up now. All IoT software will be open source. Why? Open source equals credibility. It dominates development. There is no other way about it. 
And where is open source already in the Internet of Things? Everywhere. Thank you.